Hey people, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible and that if we all work together, there is time to create the future that we would be proud to leave to the generations that come after us. I'm Amanda Scott, your host in this journey into possibility. And before we dive into the topic of this week's episode, I want to tell you a little bit about a course I'll be teaching on in a couple of months from now that's run by Natalie Nahai and the amazing young women of Advaya. If you've listened to this podcast for any length of time, you will know Natalie as both a guest and, crucially, as one of the three of us who meet at the winter solstice to look back at the year just gone and have a look forward at the one yet to come. Natalie is host of the Hive podcast, which is absolutely essential listening, and I will put a link in the show notes, particularly to the recent episode in which she interviewed Ruby and Christopher Reed of Advaya. It's completely worth listening to. And out of that conversation has grown a six-week online course that's running from the 10th of April to the 15th of May called The Digital Age understanding and reclaiming systems of power. By demystifying the powers and the principles that seem currently to be determining our collective future, the course aims to trace the through lines between the worlds of agriculture and healthcare, finance and technology in the wider context of capitalism and colonialism, and in doing so, it will explore the paths that we can take to reclaim our personal and our communal agency. And I am going to be one of the guest speakers alongside Vandana Shiva, Camilla Moreno, Carl Miller, Manish Jain, Bresh Scott, Aisha Akanbi, and a whole bunch of other really inspiring people. And it's exactly the kind of thing that this podcast is for. How can we see what's around us? And then how can we break out of it and do something bigger and better? So if you're at all interested, there is a link in the show notes. Head over and log in and join us. Anyway, that is our plug for that. So that aside, the big question that this podcast exists to answer is, what does our future look like when it works, when we get it right, when we make all the good decisions from here on in? And when we try to answer this, it seems to me there's quite a clear divide between the ideas of those of us born in the mid to late 20th century, who grew up in the world before broadband, and those born in the 90s, and especially later, who basically never got to know that strange weebling noise of the dial-up tone, and instead grew in a world where their every move was dissected by their peers on social media, and they had the whole world in their hands on a phone. We can look some other time at the emotional and spiritual impact of that, but today I want to look at the people who are determined to use all of this really fast evolving technology for good. In a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to interview someone called Grace Rachmani, who has set up a DAO, which is a disseminated autonomous organisation on the blockchain, to create not just a community, but a network of communities, which she says could be free of the need to use dollars or pounds or euros or or whatever within 10 years, which sounds pretty darn exciting to me. But thinking about that podcast, I could imagine spending 90% of the time with Grace just finding out what a DAO actually is and does. And to get to that, we would have had to unpick blockchain a bit more because the one thing I learned when we invited Raki Cordon on to speak at last summer about the blockchain was that we didn't really get to people. It went over quite a lot of people's heads. So this is the first time I've actually sought out someone on the basis that they could tell me what I wanted to hear. Usually I find people whose opinions I really respect and then just see what they say, which is the case here, to be honest. But I went looking for Cory Fico because I wanted somebody that I believed would be able to give us the absolute baselines of what is blockchain, what is a DAO, what is Web3, what is the Web3 revolution, and why does it matter? Because when I've been listening to particularly Cory's podcast, the Doycast, 
this does seem to be something that the people of this podcast are going to want to know about. So, there are links in the show notes to everything that Corey does. He is a member of the DOI Foundation, which describes itself as an international community of communities bound by a common interest in persistent infrastructure. And that idea of creating ineradicable ledgers of who owns what seems to be quite core to what they're doing. I have to say this isn't something that I'd ever thought of as being a problem, partly because I imagine it could be overturned quite quickly. But then I'm not in this world. This really is something where I only skim the surface. And there are people like Corey who really know the detail. So, as I said, Corey is a podcast host on the DoiCast. Beyond that, he describes himself as a Web3 impactivist. I love that. And a recovering workaholic, aren't we all? Actually, some of us are not recovering. He started as an entrepreneur, age nine, selling products from catalogues door to door. And ever since that, he has been most satisfied when walking the path less trodden. He has founded and failed, founded and sold, trained hundreds, consulted dozens, led teams of many, led only himself, won some awards and made countless mistakes. And through this, he says, the one constant has been growth. And he is absolutely plugged into this world where I really only glance off the surface. I have the most shallow understanding. But I know enough to know that this could make or break our chances of a flourishing future. So it matters, however hard it feels, to get our heads around what's happening, how it works, why it matters to the people who are making it work, and how we can help. So with all that in mind, people of the podcast, please do welcome Corey Fico. Corey, welcome to the Accidental Gods podcast. And thank you for taking the time out because you are in the process, I think, of talking to really quite high up political people in your state, in your country, about quite technical stuff. Tell us a little tiny bit about that, just to set the scene for where we're at in the UK and the US. Yeah, well, ultimately, the the underlying issue is that these types of technical advances are going to affect all of us throughout the entire world. Whether or not we understand them, we like them, we don't like them, it doesn't matter, these things are happening. The problem is that they're so complicated that most people can't really even process them enough to put them into a bucket, nevertheless to regulate on them or to support them or to use them. And so one of the biggest things that I've spent the last number of years of, of my life on is trying to make these complicated concepts digestible in a way that you can actually purchase the goods and services that are now available because of this, these advanced technologies. You can regulate according because accordingly because you understand you know, the innovative properties, what things should or shouldn't be, and whenever something is being manipulated because of people being people, not because of the system being faulty. Um, and taking these things and packaging them up in a way where we can all understand. So in that way, yes, that's led me to conversations with a number of people from entrepreneurs trying to build in this space, developers trying to find opportunities in this space, uh, Joe and Jane, every person trying to figure out what to do with it, you know, what next steps they have, and of course, regulators. And as of late, it's a lot more conversations with regulators because whether we like it, <laughs> talking about the world, you know, the innovation's happening regardless with or without us, but whether or not we like it, how that happens is really kind of controlled by our regulators. If they don't want something to happen a certain way, even if they don't understand it, they can really handcuff the, the innovation or for that matter, even make it impossible to bring forth certain things. And there's a lot of really amazing opportunities, which I'm sure that uh, we'll talk about. I know that you've had an interest you've mentioned before in previous conversations and like being able to vote and also to there's a lot of, you know, in a transparent way. And there's a lot of the list goes on and on and on. But yes. So as of currently, we've got tomorrow morning, I'm meeting with the committee for House Bill 764 in the state of Missouri, which goes through how regulators should treat Bitcoin, how they should treat uh, Bitcoin miners, um, how they should treat uh, tokens in general, whether or not they do or don't classify as securities and how they should treat just innovation in general. So that way they can create 
fair and reasonable regulations so people can start to build without having to worry that they're going to look over their shoulder and get sued about something. Because that's the way, at least here in the States, the SEC has gone about things is they basically regulate through enforcement, which is not a great way to go about innovating things. But yeah, so it's, it's been keeping me busy as of late and in a number of different uh, places. But And it's quite frankly, not where I would want to have spent my time. Like I'm not political by nature, like uh, um, I'm probably the most center person you can talk to. It's, but at the same time, it seems like just because I know that this is where I need to be, I've been spending more time there, for better or for worse. And we'll head into what I really want to talk about in a second. But I struggle to imagine, frankly, anyone within the UK's legislature getting their head around this. Have you got smart people in Missouri who can grasp the magnitude of what you're saying? I, I think most UK MPs, as far as I can tell, have got their head around Twitter and they can rant. But anything more technical than that would really give them serious trouble. I And if somebody is listening and wants to tell me that they have a technical-minded MP, I'll be terribly happy. But hey, is this a thing in the US? You've got people who can actually get this? Well, so fortunately for Europe, uh, the European Union actually has been passing some fairly reasonable legislation so far trying to with the, the MICA bill, M-I-C-A. Um, and now it's not perfect, but it is moving in the right direction. So that's favorable. Um, actually more favorable than anything happening in the States as of yet, with some notable standouts being like Wyoming, um, that they're really trying to be champions in the space. But in Missouri, yes, we have a number of, and in government in general, I think you have a number of really intelligent people who are capable of understanding what they don't know. And what we hope is that they're intelligent people who assemble around them the experts who can communicate to them in simple terms so they can understand whether or not, you know, they can understand it in a way where they can regulate on it appropriately and whether or not it's true or just being sold to them. Now, that said, yes, polit politics are hard too because on top of the people not themselves by nature being technical. So we just hope that they by and large aren't technical. There's a handful of people that are, but they, by and large, aren't technical, so they're trying hopefully have good counsel of people that are technical and can make good decisions. Like, like for instance, like running a business, a good entrepreneur doesn't have to be good at everything. They have to be just really good at getting good people around them. And politicians are the same way, as they need to be able to, their, their, their staff that needs to be good. Um, but what I've seen that's been the most concerning, but this is not unique to my experiences, is just everything being politicized and weaponized. It doesn't, it's like, okay, if, if one side picks and says, okay, we agree with this, the other side has, has to say they don't, just so that way they're at odds. And that's, that's a wider issue, but one not isolated to, you know, crypto or blockchain oriented technologies. No, we need a new political system. And I did listen to your podcast on politics recently. It was really interesting, but let's, we we'll maybe get to that later. Let's go right back to the basics. And define for people listening in simple terms what blockchain is and why we might want it, how it's useful in the world. Yeah. So in simple terms, I think people hear blockchain and all these other terms, crypto, et cetera, and it doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to try to describe them in a way that gets 80% of the answer with 20% of the mental effort. So because otherwise it's, uh, you know, you can get lost in the details and 99.9% .9 of people are at a basics level. Now, so that said, there might be like a little nuance here or there or the other for somebody who's a super expert level who might look at this and go, oh, well, but you didn't clarify this. Well, yeah, I get that. We got to start somewhere. So in that way, uh, blockchain is essentially just think of it like a chain, you know, links connecting together. So blockchain is just a chain of linked devices. So it could be like a phone or a computer. And in that way, you go, okay, well, Blockchain, well, how is that special, right? Well, if you have one computer that says something's happening and another computer that says that it's not, then the question is, is who's right, right? Now, if you have 500 computers saying one thing and then one computer saying another, then it's a lot easier to reconcile just through computer code it, the bad actor. And the bad actor could be, you know, something malicious, like they're trying to say that something happened that didn't happen because of their own self-interest, or it could just be, you know, 
imperfection. It could be some kind of issue in their, their code or whatever it might be, their computer access to the internet. Um, so in that way, it goes, okay, so you can, if you have 500 different devices, phones, computers, whatever it might be linked up, you can create a system where they all just kind of validate each other. They all kind of see, okay, what's the right information that's going on here? Like just like a giant spreadsheet. Well, in that way, you can have private blockchains, you know, something owned by Google. So Google could, ha let's say that they have sensitive information that they want to make sure doesn't get taken down or uh, hacked into or stolen or whatever it might be. So they can do one of a couple different things. They can put parts of that information on 500 different devices. So anybody could get into 100 of the 500 devices and still not have the full picture. Or they could have something that's backed up that they can't lose on a number of devices. So somebody would have to take on, down all 500 devices. Let's say like North Korea would have to take down all 500 devices in order for them to actually lose access to that permanently. So that's very powerful in a private sense. But in a public sense, we can actually collectively, I can own a device, and you can own a device, and whoever's listening, they can have own a device, and we can all be a part of validating the thing that we care about. So let's just say we have a public blockchain that's all around you know, reforestation, whatever it might be. And you could have a you know, public blockchain go, okay, this is what we're working on. This is what we're doing. Well, we can validate that that's what's happening and write a simple code. And then with our phones and our computers, we can go, you know, okay, is this happening or is it not? And if it's, you know, something, somebody tries to get, get in who's a bad actor, they, unless they have the computing power to out compute the entire network, every single other person's phones and devices, they're not going to be able to put any false information there. And then that allows us to do all kinds of fun stuff, which, you know, we can go down that rabbit hole, but it really allows us with the simplest one is Bitcoin to just start there. It allows us to basically exchange money and know that, okay, I had this. So let's say that we walked at, at, up at a grocery store and you said, hey, Corey, um, send me 10 bucks because you didn't bring your credit card and um, you're going to buy those mangoes, whatever it might be. And go, well, in this case, you may not be worried about whether or not I do or don't actually have the $10 because it's only $10. But what if we're 10000 or 15000 And then you want to know that I actually have the money and you don't want to and there, you don't really have access to my bank and all that. It'd be super expensive to do that. And then if I sent the money to you, I don't want you to be like, hey, I never received your $10 or $10,000. Yeah. Send be. it again. <laughs> Send it again. Yeah. So Bitcoin essentially solved that, what they call the double spend problem which in banking, there's a whole issue with that is that you can double spend or you can even make false stocks and like you have a bunch of extra shares of stocks and there are yeah. actually shares of stocks. It was a big issue with kind of like overstock.com and everything last year, but you can create a bunch of you know, false money, false stocks, false value. And you can also say that like the money just gets lost along the way. Like there's stories right now you can look up where people send $4 million and the banks just lose it. $40 million are just like, we don't know. We got to find it. We got to track it down. Whereas with Bitcoin, you have a ledger that everybody can validate so nobody has to trust each other that one, the first person has the money and the second person received the money. And then the network makes sure that in moving forward, that somebody can't falsify that in the future unless they have enough power to basically out compute the entire rest of the chain for their computing power. So each transaction becomes a block on the chain. And as soon as another transaction yeah. happens, the old block is each block is replicated on however many nodes there are in the system. So let's say 500. And so the fact that you gave me $10 goes equally to all 500. And then as soon as Gerald over there pays somebody else $10, that goes on top of it. And it it moves back down the chain very quickly. And you would have to change the entire chain on every computer to falsify this and that that would take more computing power than exists on the planet at the moment, and therefore it's not worth it. Yes. Yeah. So what we have then is a distributed, uncorruptible ledger that everybody can agree that we all trust. Correct? Yep. Without having to have a central authority to give that trust to. And so let's head from there. You mentioned Bitcoin. Bitcoin was an early iteration of this. And I guess you were in it early enough when you could mine a Bitcoin on, on your own standard desktop computer. And now, as far as I can tell, you have to have server farms in China right next to the hydroelectric dams to have enough power to to actually mine a coin. And, and <laughs> it's not uh, uh, hundreds of little people in their back bedrooms doing something for fun. It's, it's five or 10 very big server farms using 
last thing I heard was more power than the whole of New Zealand per day. And that this is not necessarily a grand thing. So tell us about that. Yeah, so that's actually interesting. So anytime that you get information, I found that there's always a narrative. And the question is, okay, why, you know, who stands to benefit from that narrative? Hmm. And right now there is a multi-trillion dollar banking industry that stands to benefit from the narrative that Bitcoin is highly power inefficient. Okay. If you actually dig into that further, those claims are unsubstantiated. And in fact, actually, if you look at our, if you dig far enough into it, you'll actually see that the existing banking system with the, with the full amount of resources between building all the brick and mortars, between the creation of the money, between managing all the systems is actually far more energy intensive than all of the, the you know, any of the major ones, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. Right. Um, even the proof of work systems, um, which is super relevant uh, just because at the end of the day, we have to think future forward. You know, the where does that really mean for energy depletion? What does that mean for the resources of the planet? Like, you know, wh- how are we evolving as a people? Does this make sense? Is it sustainable? Um, which my nonprofit was focuses on thinking about sustainability. So that's one of those things that I mean clearly is of mind with me. But so in that way, um, I can say a couple different things. One is you can still mine on your computer. Oh, can you? They actually have uh, the computers you can buy. Actually, uh, so Calix Solutions is a computer that we like. You can you can mine off of. You can also get like an S nineteen miner. Um, so you can, and that's actually a fairly durable miner. But you can get, especially with uh, some of the smaller blockchains, you can get just a small device, a couple hundred bucks. But if you're willing to put in eight hundred or a thousand dollars, you can you can start mining effectively mining Bitcoin okay. today. Um, you don't need to spend 50 grand. We, we might have to describe to people what that involves, because I think most of the people yeah. here are not in the tech space and they don't understand what mining a Bitcoin is and, and why you need any computer power at all. Can you just give us the edited highlight of that? Yeah. So actually, I can summarize that super simple, actually, because we already talked about the blockchain. So let's say that in this case, and I see a future where you can mine, quote unquote, and we'll explain what that means um, in a second, on your phone. I really want that future where you're able to basically be part of that whole ecosystem. Wow. All you're really doing is if you're one of those 500 phones that are part of the part of the blockchain or on Bitcoin, one of the millions of devices, whatever it might be, is that that's mining is just, just the reward you get for keeping the network validating it that's just your part of keeping track of the spreadsheet so it's kind of like uh think of it like you and five million other people are working towards something and then the mining is the reward that comes back and and the way that it's the the reward so you you're you're not actually like chipping away a bitcoin but the new bitcoin comes into circulation over time with the last one being 2150 um, so you kind of like as new new Bitcoin comes in there, it goes, well, who does the new Bitcoin go to? It goes to the people that are basically keeping the network going. And so they they use their computers to create the computing power that makes sure that no bad actors can come in and you know, maliciously falsify stuff. That North Korea can't just come in and say that the, this much money went to North Korea, you know, and whatever it might be or whomever else. So and that's it. And so the mining is just a reward that you get. Now, because you have to solve an equation, which I'll explain that's kind of one layer deeper. Um, but because you have to solve an equation with your computer, you're essentially solving like a randomly created problem and everybody's solving that problem. And then once they, the problem gets solved, the reward gets distributed to those who solve it. And then that block is mine. It's, it's locked in history and you move forward. So in that way, it's just rewards. It's just basically getting rewarded for giving your phone device up and because of the fact that the solving the problem is random, and yes, you can increase your odds if you have more computing power, if you've got a big server farm, it increases the odds, right? But you could still do it off your small device and, and mine Bitcoin as well. And so there's there breaks out to be a cost for every device where you can be, depending on the market, most people on a, a household device without going too far can be positive break even with any energy expenses and equipment costs over a long enough period of time. Should they choose to want to do that? Now, I would say that I'm not of the person who says that you're going to go get rich being a mining a miner, but you might want to do that as a way to say that this is your way of contributing to the network. Like you can pay for all of your expenses and then some, uh, typically if you do it intelligently, and contribute to making sure that the Bitcoin network is true. 
and that it continues on and that people can exchange value and that it doesn't get taken down. Gosh, I can feel some really big rabbit holes opening up, but I think they're quite arcane and and maybe we'll leave that for another time. So at the moment, we've looked at Bitcoin, which is proof of work, which is my computer helped to solve a fairly complex cryptographic problem in order to create the next block. There are, and, and clearly you're not one of them, but there are people who say that using power, computing power to do that isn't ideal and that we should have other ways of verifying the network or of people having access to it. Tell us a little bit about proof of stake and why it's different and why it might be useful if you think it is useful. Yes, I think that, so first and foremost, I think it'd be very easy to just start propping up all these different uh, electrically intensive systems and justifying why they should exist and then exploiting an energy grid that in many cases is already failing and or decaying. So, I mean, that that is clearly an issue. I mean, we can't uh, collectively as a community can't oversimplify things and just say, hey, you know, Bitcoin's not using a bunch of energy uh, comparative to other things. Therefore, we should just continue using a bunch of energy. I think we need to, one, identify the value of the energy usage and compare it to other sources. So then we can say comparatively, is it better or worse? And are we on the right trajectory? Um, and I also think that we need to recognize the energy sources themselves because another issue is kind of the local regional global issue with energy is that energy doesn't transport well so you can have let's say energy i mean i believe it's like 500 miles or something like that it's like it's really it's reasonable range that where you have to create it from to where you use it from so what that means is that you have to create energy in places that are not energy rich and that has a very huge cost because you're transporting energy into places that it doesn't naturally have it and then burning it in ways. And you have to be able to have the energy be beyond what the grid needs because it pulls from basically you create the supply and then the grid pulls from that supply. So you're bringing in a bunch of energy often through coal or worse, depending on if you're in a third world country um, and whatever it might be. Hopefully it's natural gas or beyond, but it's some some kind of very ineffective system you're transporting it there you're you're mining it from somewhere else and you, then you're actually building out a network and let's say i don't know middle of uh, well even the middle of the united states there are some places that are not very ideal and then you're forced to use that energy or like you've might have heard of like oil flaring and they just have to like constantly like flare off energy and things like that there's constantly all these places where the energy is just being completely not used. So in cases where you have proof of work, which is the, the proof of work, meaning that you have proof that it's true because all the computers worked at solving it. Um, so if they're working at solving it, there's the energy. So if you have proof of work, it doesn't mean that everybody everywhere in a perfect system, in a perfect society, if one were so to, to be so intelligent to create it and yeah, I, I don't know who that person is, and I I, I don't really know that I want to. Um, but the, the perfect society, if you will, to engineer it, you would have the proof of work systems next to next to places where the energy is already being thrown away, because there are a lot of places in the world where the energy is basically just being tossed out because it can't be used. So you can validate networks and without actually being you know, depleting extra resources. Um, and the good thing about a system like Bitcoin is you can do that because it doesn't matter from which parts of the world you validate those networks so long as the network is validated. Now, that's something that we have to do at an individual level because it's not being done at a governmental level. And it's the, the network itself doesn't choose, you know, your intentions. It just is getting validated or it's not. Now, so all that to say, big conversation about energy, that's a rabbit hole in and of itself. But uh, proof of stake is kind of an... What some might say as an answer to that is, okay, the proof is, is that all the people who care about the network agree. So the proof of the stake. Now, the trick is with proof of stake is there could be back to these 500 devices. Uh, the thing with proof of stake is that the 500 devices are also the people who own the network, which means that they have the most financial interest in the network. So the pro is it takes a lot less energy because the fact that you don't have to have 5 million devices. You just have to have the devices that are staked into the network. Um, now, to that end, the people who are most vested in that network are probably going to be the most 
interested in making sure that the network operates you know, in a way that is free of fraud and in line with the mission, vision, values, et cetera. However, that also opens the opportunity to, with proof of stake, where you could basically buy the network. So theoretically, if you were, let's say, China, um, not saying they would or wouldn't want to, and I'm not putting any political spin on this. I'm just saying they have the resources and the extra money. They could, let's say, buy the, they could buy out the Ethereum network and control it because they would have the they would have the stake in the network. They had enough of the nodes they could buy those out with from that point on. I'm not saying that will happen. I'm also not saying Ethereum's not a great network. I love Ethereum. I think a lot of things are built on it, but just whenever you're comparing it out, those what they call Bitcoin maxis, the maximalists who believe that Bitcoin's the only way around, they would argue that proof of stake is just kind of more of financial system 2.0 because the ones who had the stake in the systems were the ones who got to write the rules and validate what did or didn't happen. Now on the opposite side, those who are not Bitcoin maxis would say, that's easy to say, but you can also validate much larger amounts of issues from voting to property rights to contracts to all that for that are very data intensive for much less costs, much less energy. And there are safeguards put in place on proof of stake systems to keep them from going off the rails and being manipulated. And also good thing is, is, you know, the market can also choose because if China were to buy out the Ethereum network, then create a new network. Yeah. Yeah. You write a new network. So in that way, hopefully that not only explains proof of work a little bit, proof of stake a little bit, but also talks about the arguments on both sides. Yes. And let's not get embroiled in those because most of us out here in the rest of the world don't really care. We just want a system that works. And then the question is, how do we create that? Yeah. So let's take a step back. I want to move on to DAOs. What are DAOs? And then I want to really move on to Web3. But very briefly, one of the foundations of this podcast is that the current economic system is wholly broken. We need to create a new way of accounting for and exchanging value and storing it. And that potentially... Cryptocurrencies, however they are created, are possibly the first time we've had a currency that is not backed by violence worldwide since the time when humanity decided that we weren't going to have tribal sharing, we were going to actually need bits of something, tokens, to have a common value stake. Leaving aside the exact technology... Can you see ways in which we could create some kind of blockchain-based cryptocurrency that would form a sensible and sane global way of exchanging value? And if so, how is it created in a way that is equitably distributed so that it isn't the case that the people with the power have the money? Yes, that is the reason why I'm in this space. So... All the technological stuff, yes, I, I, I like that. I get it. I'm a, a techie person. That's fun. But I really want to do my part in trying to make a better world. And so underlying premise with the podcast, absolutely agree. That said, okay, well, okay, let's, let's dive in a little bit. Starting with DAOs, it's a decentralized, meaning that there isn't a central hub. And then autonomous, meaning that it can operate on its own organization. Now, I will say, most DAOs are varying shades of centralized. Some are more super decentralized and some are less decentralized. It depends on kind of which DAO you're looking at, for those who know. And many of them are not yet autonomous. They're working towards autonomy, meaning that there's still people with, and assuming that we're looking at a good DAO, because there's some beautiful DAOs out there, but assuming that we're looking at a good DAO, they are good people with a good vision who are working towards writing their processes in a way that it can become code where it doesn't actually have to be all the efforts done by people, much like a traditional organization. I actually joke that uh, my next book would be 50 shades of Tao. So, <laughs> so that's, a, um, there's a lot of, there's a, a range there. There's a spectrum, but to kind of speak about it generalistically, about why it would matter as opposed to a normal organization. And for that matter, why even central organizations like Microsoft, et cetera, might want their own DAOs inside of Microsoft. In a traditional organization, 
you have a pyramid. You know, I've got the top, the, the people need to kind of go up and down the chain. And that's, you know, it is what it is. That's been the way that we've organized ourselves throughout history. Humanity has. Um, well, for the first time, our society has gotten so complex and so specialized that you can be an absolute expert in the type of wood made to, to, for chairs. Like, and not even just chairs in general, but a specific type of chair. You can be a, like spend your whole life becoming that foremost expert. And this whole top-down hierarchy doesn't make as much sense whenever you start looking at hyper-complex, complicated societies where we now have airplanes with you know, thousands and thousands of parts. And you go, okay, well, if you have all this specialization spread about to where it really can't be managed, it can be organized in a certain way that the efforts go towards a shared cause. But you start having people that are acting with some level of autonomy where they can kind of have purview over what they do and how they do it so long as the outcome is, is yielded. We didn't really have a good mechanism, a good way for those people to get paid and a good way for them to contribute to anything. And we definitely didn't have, and this is the biggest thing for me with DAOs and blockchain in general, we didn't have a good way to collectively generate intellectual property. So we didn't have a way where you and 3,400 other people could collectively say that we contributed and have it tracked how much you contributed towards a certain piece of, let's say, computer code to make it simple. But it could be also a, a certain pharmaceutical even that was created, a certain cancer drug or whatever it might be. There was no way for you and hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to collectively own and create something. Like only Pfizer owned that thing, right? Right. And so in that way, you go, okay, well, how do you create a tool where they can actually, that we can advance into where the future is already going? And it's, it's DAOs because you can set up on the blockchain a community. You can set up the rules, uh, call it a DAO. You have varying shades of, uh, shades of DAO, but you have set up the rules and say, okay, this is what we're working towards. We are collectively working towards creating a cancer drug together. And then you can assign basically like rules and bounties towards like when certain milestones are met and whenever a certain outcome is hit, like an actual a drug, you know, let's say funds are raised to take to, to clinicals and it passes clinical trials and it goes off and gets approved. Then you can see who contributed how much and then you can reward them in perpetuity for their contribution. So that means that you and 4,200 other people created this cancer drug you can you own that cancer drug forever. And then the cool thing about that is, okay, what about the next level up? Let's say that the newest cancer drug is basically only 2% different than the oldest cancer drug, but it has 50 times the results. Well, right now with the current patent system, you have to create a completely new product that has nothing that would be, if you took it to patent court, somebody could argue that you're using a similar drug. So they create products that aren't better. They create products that are more defensible after the patent shelves drop, Right, which is why... It, the healthcare costs keep going up and up and up and up and up like, like crazy because they have to bring in new drugs that are patentable because once they become generic, then you don't have, there's the money isn't there for Pfizer to take them through clinicals because then generic companies could just copy it and they're not going to spend all the money on all that. So in that way you go, okay, all right. So DAO allows you not only to create the first layer, which is it, you know, which is like the innovation, the intellectual property, but it also allows for iteration. So you could have, instead of like, you could have, a cancer drug that 42,000 other DAOs, which with collectively 120 million other people now iteratively add to and still have the end result being like a new cancer drug where everybody down the chain from the first contributors all the way to the last contributors get their respective portions. And so DAOs are the only mechanism. And I know it gets kind of complicated in that way, but to just say it, that we're moving into a society that is mostly intellectual property. It's mostly well, property rights in general. That's a whole other thing. But, and it's mostly code and it's mostly like advanced technologies. Like, for instance, uh, to go down a quick rabbit hole, and I'll make it real fast because it's easy to do uh, AI. If you have AI, extremely intelligent AI, would you want that to be owned by Facebook or Google? Or would you want that to be owned by a decentralized autonomous organization of, let's say, 42 million people that collectively say, this is what we want AI to do and not do. We want to vote on whether or not it should be able to mine our information from our children or not. Like if it sees everything that's going on and it sees our kid just said something and they're nine years old, we want it to recognize whether or not that kid should get in different classes in school or not. 
Like we can vote on those things because collectively we own it. And also collectively, whatever we build, we receive rewards off of it. But we have a say not only on where the money's coming from, but how. Whereas if it's owned by a central authority, you don't have that anymore. And then you get into this winner takes all scenario where, especially looking at the way AI is advancing and quantum computing and all that kind of stuff like that, it's not unreasonable to think that 5, 10, 15, 20, sometime in, in, in our lifetimes, somebody could get to the point in time where their AI is 10 times smarter, 10 times faster, and then it's learning by the second. So it goes from 10 times, 100 times, to 1,000 times faster in one minute than all the other AI collectively in the world. And at that point in time, if it's a designed strictly for the purpose of mining resources, you know, i.e. making money, and then at that point in time, then the globe is controlled or, you know, the, the sport of solar system, whatever that looks like is controlled by that organization. Yeah. Should they choose? And we only have to hope that the people who own the organization choose to be morally just and not use that power, even though they have it. Yeah, that always struck me as the definition of the technological singularity is when we create the system that can design and build its own successor, we are effectively redundant in the evolution of of that kind of intelligence. And at that point, the exponential growth is, we have no idea where it's going to take us. Yeah. And a DAO is a perfect way for us to try to grapple with these large concepts. You go, okay, what are things that we would like, we would prefer to be owned by a lot of us as opposed to a handful of us? And how can we design systems that benefit everybody who's contributing in a way that is in perpetuity? Because that's the other thing about a DAO too, is you can create a token around an outcome. And you can, if that token is yielding a result, like i.e. a cancer drug, you brought it to market and there's money to be made off of that. Unlike if you worked for Pfizer, where you only got paid for your time, you would be able to move yourself over into the space where entrepreneurs are at, where you actually get paid for your efforts in perpetuity, so long as your efforts are yielding results. And that's where a lot of people get struck in this poverty trap is that they're constantly trading their time for money, just enough money to survive at the expense of all the other time they can put in other places. So if you can create something iteratively that pays you back through a DAO, then that also allows us to open up a lot of different opportunities economically for people who might not otherwise have them. Gosh, this opens up so many fields. I really want to move on to Web3, but I have a question in that last statement. I have so many questions in, in the DAO field. But... I started off life as a veterinary surgeon. You're side of the Atlantic, that would be veterinarian. Having worked in science, so much of science is in not getting results. I, I was talking to a social scientist yesterday and she said, now n nobody's allowed to get a PhD unless it's actually proved that something does work. Where When I was growing up, lots of PhDs proved that something didn't work. And actually that was really useful. But in that world, you only get money if you work for Pfizer at the moment and you work in something that doesn't work, you still get your salary. I'm not suggesting I think this is a good way of doing things, but it does allow you to explore things that might work but don't. If we go to a world where you only get the funding for the stuff that works, that pyramid collapses quite fast because you can't do the experiments that you don't think are going to work because you're not going to make any money. Has anybody thought their way through that? Yes, yes. So that's actually a big issue. So I have an entrepreneurial background. So I know what it's like to actually pay people for services. And the fact that if you can't pay somebody before an outcome's yielded, they can't show up to work because they don't have food <laughs> or a place to live, etc. Yeah, right. So there clearly needs to resolve that issue. And there are, of course, you can set up a DAO that has, uh, you can set up through the rules, if you want to pay people, you can do that. It's just you define what the the terms of payment, but I will say, that's been an issue in the industry and an issue that I've talked about a lot is that right now, because it's a nascent industry, a lot of it is being done based off of results. And the problem is with that is I've seen so many people get super excited about a project that that's, I truly believe the project will be successful eventually, but they're expecting it to be successful tomorrow or worse. And I don't ever advise this. They're trying to, because they want the token to moon, go to the moon, go up or whatever. That's not why I'm crypto. That's I don't ever advise that. That's not what matters to me. But for people who do that, they expect some kind of outcome to happen tomorrow. Um, and whenever it doesn't, because it's not how it works, we overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in 10. Six months from now, 
there's huge attrition. All these people came in, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of people came in and they wanted to help in some way, but there wasn't money to pay them to help yet. And the money then, whenever it actually starts to work, comes in well after they're gone because they didn't have that. The, most DAOs don't have a clear structure for, okay, here's how we're going to divvy out funds from people, kind of contributors in the beginning. And here's a way that we can afford to do it between here and there. I do think that we'll understand because one of the things as a, someone who's thinks about innovation all day, every day, I also think about history and I recognize that we sometimes throw away all of the lessons from the past whenever we want to engineer something for the future. And we don't look at, okay, why did those things come into, come into be? DAOs have to grapple with the fact that whenever they start as an organization, there is an obligation to any of the contributors coming in. And so they need to have funds for that. And they need to have ways to pay people to do certain things. Even if it's less to start, like they need to recognize that there has to be some sustainability there, or otherwise it's relegated to only be done by the people who are already financially well off enough to be able to join a DAO and then wait for a reward four or five years from now. Which, I mean, fortunately, I've I've been able to stay in this space because I, I could do things like that, but like that's the vast minority of the world's population where they can just step in and be like, hey, I'm going to contribute to this. And, you know, I just want to see it happen. For impact alone, I'd be satisfied, one. Most people can't say that because they still have to survive. And two, you know, if there is a financial return, if and when, I don't, if it's four years from now, that's fine. Like, so that said, that is an issue. Some are solving it better than others. But then that kind of creates a scenario where some DAOs are becoming more centralized. So, yeah, there's pros and cons throughout all this to make a simple thing complicated. Can you see a way to a world where we have tokens that store exchange and account for value flowing in such a way that people can do what they want to do and explore the stuff that they want to explore in a world where they have enough food, water, shelter, clean air, and social connection, assuming that those are the real basics. If you listen to Simon Misho, we also need kind of sewage control and industrial creation. But where we've got the essentials of living that are exchangeable for tokens in a way that the tokens do not accumulate at the top, how does cryptocurrency or does cryptocurrency enable more equity? And if so, how? Let, let me just take this one step back. We started off with money in human society, the small portion of human society that used money, because for most of human history, we haven't. It was little bits of metal because it's, it's ductile and it doesn't decay. And you can clip the edges off it. And if you're Nero, you can make the silver, you, you can water it down with nickel and it still looks much the same. And so you could trade one little coin for another little coin, and it was actual physical stuff. And then we moved to the era of imaginary money, which is what we're in at the moment, which, as you said, governments could basically make it up out of nothing and hand it out and and hope that the whole system didn't collapse. And that's kind of, we're a bit like Wiley e. Coyote. We're way out across the canyon on that one. At some point, someone's going to realise that these things are just basically bits and bytes on a computer and that they have no reference to anything tangible. If we start off with cryptocurrency knowing that it isn't reference to anything tangible, how are we going to create it and share it in a way that everybody agrees that it has value and that its value is exchangeable for actual tangible things that you can eat and drink and build a house with? That's a fantastic question. So I'll start with the simple answer, which is Bitcoin has value because the network has value because being able to transport millions of dollars or tens of dollars, whatever you want, or 42 cents and it costs you pennies, um, that in seconds or minutes, that, that that's valuable. Now, that said, you start getting more abstract as you get further down the cryptocurrency rabbit hole. So I believe, personally speaking, this is a personal belief, and I'm sure not all in the crypto, I know that not all in the industry agree with me, but that those things should be attach attached to tangible value, that it should be attached to proof of you know, intellectual property, proof of real property. So taking like proof of ownership and putting it on the blockchain, I believe that that's 
where the value the, for the future is really at. So there's $500 trillion worth of physical assets that could be put on the blockchain and you could own them better. You could, you know, you could get to the point in time where you can own $10 worth of a 345 unit apartment complex that yields rents. Um, never before has somebody who let's say was impoverished, had the opportunity to get access to anywhere where the money just didn't just evaporate. Because right now, whenever you look at basically even middle class, most middle class, they're just struggling to survive. They, they're not able to save up enough money to get into financial instruments that won't deplete in value. Because even if you're saving money, the money that you have is, we, we know inflation, right? It's going down in value over time. So even if you have money, until you get into something that's at least stable or increasing in value, you're losing money by the second. So all the efforts that you went are just depleting in value. And so what happens is there's a good percentage of the world that doesn't get the access to be able to get into like museum art pieces or you know, real estate or any of the kind of stuff that we've learned to hold value or appreciate in value over time. Now, if you take that and put that on the blockchain and then turn that into a token and allow somebody and to have proof of the fact that this, this one token is actually this percentage of this apartment complex. And nobody can say that it like you don't own it or nobody can create more tokens of the apartment complex so they can water down the value of it like they do with the dollar. They just distribute more. And you can have all of that verifiable on the blockchain. Like that's extraordinarily empowering. And then that's more like, so we're kind of getting into layers of abstraction. The next layer of ab abstraction down is where we go, okay, those are tangible things we already know have value, you know, and saying there's a better way for you to be able to purchase them, get into them at lower values, own them, be able to sell them, transfer countries with them and not get in. Like that's all valuable. But what about the layer where we get to define value for ourselves? Because this is the first time in human history where we can, with this layer of complexity, with how complex our society is and the things that we value are, we can collectively as a group go, you know what? You know what I think is more important as money or equally as important as money? Planting a tree, whatever it might be. And assign a value to that and create a token for every single time that that happens. And then have that token have value not only through inside of our community, but outside of our community to other communities that go, you know what? I also value that. And I think it's equally as value as my, you know, save a whale coin, whatever it might be. And so long as people in the community and outside the community find that that's valuable, then it has value. Now that said, you go, okay, it's attached to a real outcome, right? Not just like there are a lot of in crypto, there's a lot of people saying we're going to do something. So it's a hypothetical outcome, like not realized outcome and then creating to like, I don't, I'm not advocating for that. Okay. Yeah. Cause that, that's just inventing money again, isn't it? Yeah. That's just inventing money again. Yeah. So it's like, you're like, you know what I really like, you know, you know, what I really don't like about the banks is that I'm not the bank. So I'm going to create my own form of money and off I go. So in that way, like attached to actual outcome, because then it gives access to the rest of the, the world to go, you know what? I also find value in that too. And I'd rather trade my money for that outcome. And so long as the outcome is tracked so I can verify that the outcome happens, yeah, then the rest of the world might find some value to the fact that I contributed to that in some way, much like people mining Bitcoin contributed to people being able to send money by getting some Bitcoin in return. You can get a token for a tree getting planted. Now, how all these systems work, though, really, it depends on us. Like we're at a point right now where te technologically it isn't the issue for us to say what we find valuable, how we interact with it, how we compensate each other. The issue is just how creative we are with actually building these systems out and whether or not regulations allow for us to innovate in these new creative ways. So like if, if you don't like the way that cryptocurrency is working right now, and by and large, I don't. Um, there are some things I love, of course. Of course, I wouldn't be in this industry. But if you don't, if you don't like the way it's working, create something new. There are tools, there are communities, there are systems. You step into it. You can build kind of a parallel system and operate inside of it. Try it out. Like this is a beautiful time in history. So for all of those who are, who are disenfranchised and thinking that crypto is just another one of these things you get to decide whether or not it is or it is or isn't like write down on a board. And by the way, you can reach out to me, um, go on LinkedIn. You can reach out Corey Fico, also Twitter. Um, 
But you can just reach out, DM me and say, hey, look, this is what I care about. What do I do about it? Because chances are, you'd be surprised, most people are surprised that there's already an organization probably working in that sphere, working on that, that they can just join. Or there's tools already existing, not like tomorrow tools, but today's tools where they can build around that, that, that core cause or passion. Brilliant. Again, lots of rabbit holes. We could go down there. We might get to. If we, if I remember, we'll get back to Hullcoin because I think it's a really interesting example. But let's move on to further down my list of things I wanted to talk about because we've only got two down. The Web3 revolution. <laughs> Tell us what it is and what its core values are as you understand them. Who's perpetuating it? And particularly, how can people listening become involved? Because it's, it's a continuation of what you've been saying. So Web3 in the simplest possible way is web one like the first version of the the internet like you couldn't contribute to it so it was read only you could go on you could read stuff but you couldn't contribute to it the not in any meaningful way and then web two it was read write you could read it you could also write onto it you could think facebook you get in there and be like oh this is what's going on with my day here's you know what i care about you you contribute to it but you still don't really own facebook per se like you definitely don't own Facebook. Zuckerberg owns Facebook. Yeah, they might own you, but the but, but the uh, in that way though, it was read write, and then the Web three. The concept of Web three is read write own. So you actually own this thing in a in a meaningful way. Like you actually have say on what happens. Meaning you can vote. Like if you don't like the way that Facebook operates or like if you have a social media platform like Facebook, not only do you get to read what's on there, you get to write what's on there because you're a contributor, but you can also have a say in whether or not it operates a certain way. And you can also too, if there's rewards, financial returns from your contributions, then you can also receive those returns. So it allows you to go from a way where in a much more, real manner, you can actually own the bits of the internet that you create or that you contribute to. And it's as simple as that, really. Uh, And how does that take us to revolution? Because I've heard you refer to the Web3 revolution, and it sounded like it was very aligned to the premise of this podcast, that it was creating a much more equitable, regenerative, sustainable world. How do you get from read, write, own to that? Yes. So for last thousands of years there was no way to iteratively build value for the poor and middle classes i mean for that matter there wasn't even middle classes for you know all of history um there's no way for you to contribute in a way where the moment your time is done your income is over now you do need obviously to cover your income because that was something we we touched on earlier because you have to pay the bills right But above and beyond paying the bills and having your minimum needs met, which I do agree also includes social. But after you have your minimum needs met, like what happens towards future contributions? What can you really hand on to your kids or your community if you don't have kids? And there's not a lot of ways to do that that don't also require more money that aren't something you can easily get into. And whenever you allow for fractionalized contribution and ownership with returns and perpetuity on everything that we touch, and most importantly, in, you know, the internet, some people forget we're actually at the beginning stages. Like, it's not that old. Even the internet, I'm not even talking about blockchain. Like, the internet, as we understand it, is not that old. And if you look at plot it out as over time, kind of, you know, and start thinking about where the future is going to be in 2030 between artificial intelligence and also to even, like, the internet of things and oh, they're all communicating back and forth. Your refrigerator talks to your phone, talks to your front door or whatever. And you start thinking about all this, you go, okay, well, how do I actually get in on that? So as the industry scopes up, I actually get some kind of return on that. And by and large, most people can't unless they actually own some piece of that in some kind of fractional way where their contributions are returns in perpetuity. And the ownership is something that they can, they, they can hold no matter what, when, no matter whether or not their government goes down, or their government doesn't, you know, feels one way or another politically, you know, because you're thinking over a long enough timeline, right? If you look over a 20, 30, 40 year timeline, you think of generations, you just not to get too scary or anything like that. But you go two, 300 years back, the governments that are around today, by and large, aren't the same governments. 
And so you start thinking about like generational wealth and how you can start to reshape things over time. You want to be able to create mechanisms where 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years from now, you aren't reliant on the contract rights. Even if you are more advanced and you have money, you aren't reliant on the contract rights of a government that's now been since modified or changed or whatever it might be, because then all of a sudden your generational wealth is gone. I mean, you're gone, but it'll affect your kids, your you know grandkids or whatever community members, et cetera. So all of these tools allow you something that is without those thir- those central parties. I mean, ideally, with, uh, without those central parties, you now have something that you can verify you own and over time can reap whatever returns based off of however you design it. So that allows not only the opportunity financially for the lower and middle classes, but it also, I think the biggest thing is it allows for hope because right now, if you're in those situations, you don't really have the, a lot of tools and you don't see a clear way to get out of your situation. And, and there's plenty of people that would step up and say, just pick yourself up by your bootstraps, but they've clearly never lived in those situations and had those lack of resources, et cetera. Um, and so they start to see, okay, here's a clear way where I can contribute get the outcomes I'm looking for. And then on the opposite side of that, there's trillions of dollars worth of resources that want to get poured into people that now no longer care where they live. So long as they have internet access, they can contribute to this larger thing and they can also get contributed, you know, contribute in a fair way. So whether you live in Ghana or you live in, you know, Colombia, it doesn't really matter if the outcome you, you yield is, is worth $120,000 a year plus whatever, perpetuity stock type, you know, comparable, like that's what you're going to get paid now because you can contribute to these larger communities. So long as that community actually abides by those principles and pays those people fairly, regardless of where they live. But all of these things didn't exist before in the same manner. And now they do. Now you can get creative on like how you pick a particular sector or a particular industry and build on that. But at the end of the day, owning something and owning it in perpetuity where it can't get taken away from you really, really accounts for a lot. Brilliant. It's really interesting because listening to your podcast, I had somehow got the idea that we were building an anti-capitalist, differently energized, different property rights subculture that was basically forking out a new government. Did I get that wrong or is that inherent in what you just said? I would say that to approach the conversation in a way that makes sense. We need to change things. There are two ways to overgeneralize that you can change them. One is you can set it on fire and then take the pieces and put try to cobble them all together. The other one is you can build something better. And over time, people can see that that's a better place to put their resources, their, their time, their energy, their money. Etc. The Buckminster Fuller idea of you, you don't overthrow the system, you create a new system that makes the old one obsolete. Yes. Brilliant. And that's what you're doing. Yes. And so in, in that way, to clarify, it's something that all governments, if, if I were in any level of government, I would adopt this wholeheartedly because I believe, I believe, okay, so for the governments that are corrupt, for the politicians that are corrupt, Nothing we can say to them matters. So clearly they're outside of this conversation because if they're trying to like, if they're extract from the people own self-interest, et cetera, like we're clearly not talking to them because there's no point in wasting energy. But of the people that are inside of a system who love their constituents, who love the people who love, who want to see a better world, who care about these causes, but are stuck operating in a certain way because the way that that system is currently designed by giving them tools to do more of the things that they care about, they can actually step in like for instance a a government bond like you could have a government official come in and say okay let's actually raise money from the community so the community actually owns this infrastructure project and then whenever we build it pay in returns based off the actual outcomes of the infrastructure build and then you actually get the outcome that you're looking for and it's not just raising tax money maybe it'll go wherever it's at pork barrel spending whatever it might be because i think by and large those who want politics to work or in politics don't want any of that kind of stuff. And so if we start giving the transparency, like sunlight being the best antiseptic, we start giving that transparency and allowing them to do the things they say they want to do and they actually want to do, hopefully, if we're talking to that section of the political sphere, then 
that allows governments themselves to transition into the ideologies that they really want to have and spend less of the times being the governments that all of us, I think even them, want to fight against. So in that way, I just want to make sure that somebody listening to this from a governmental side of things go, this is for you too. Like, so long as you aren't one of the ones that want to control the money supply for. I'd be really surprised if anybody in any government around the world <laughs> listens to this podcast. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry <laughs> unduly about that. But it seems so, from my perspective, there's a project in a city called Hull, which is in the northeast of England. It's extremely deprived. It was one of the places that used to get a lot of EU money and then we decided not to bother, turn it all down. And they've created something called Hullcoin, which is on the blockchain. And it's a social currency. And so they've defined, the governance structure has defined, but I'm guessing you could get a citizen's assembly to define what it is that's worth value. So, for instance, they might say that giving up smoking is is a good thing. And if you've gone to uh, a giving up smoking clinic, I'm, I have no idea, but whatever. And and the people there go, yep, it's showing every sign of having given up smoking. Then, then you get a whole coin and you keep getting one every two weeks until you go back onto smoking or you don't. Um, helping little old ladies across the road, uh, teaching teaching kids to read and write, mm-hmm. whole coins. And then it's not linked to the UK currency, which is interesting. It's not taxable. What it's worth then is also a highly variable feature. So you could go to I, the, the incidents that I heard was that when a football match starts, a soccer match in the UK, in the US, 10 minutes after the whistle's blown for it to start, the tickets are worth nothing. Earlier they were worth, I don't know, 50, 60 quid. Now they're worth nothing at all. But you could say, OK, they're worth half a whole coin. And you can come in 10, after, 10 minutes after the match has started and frankly, you're not going to miss very much. We've got a bunch of empty seats. You can come in and have them. Or the municipal swimming pool has a space at 11 o'clock on a Thursday morning where there's not many people here. So it's quarter of a whole coin. Come in and swim. Or the library's open and it's whatever. So you've got a social currency. Or I could say, you know what, my car, now it's worth a whole coin. You can have my car for one whole coin. And if you want to actually pay money, it's 10 grand. Yeah. So sort of. Um, so you've got a parallel currency and it seems to me that when you've created that, you could equally say, you, we've all got solar panels. We're going to give everybody solar panels and all of the money is going to be channeled. All of the energy is going to be channeled in and you will get an amount of coin dependent on the solar panels on your roof. And roughly that should be equitable. And suddenly we have ways of creating and generating currency that have got nothing to do with the current system. If we could tie that to ways of generating governance mm-hmm. that has nothing to do with the current system. I, I love your enthusiasm for you think there are people in the current political system who are actually not kleptomaniac psychopaths. I haven't met many. I didn't say what percentage. <laughs> oh, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I can. I could probably name the ones in the UK, and it wouldn't take me very long. Um, let's assume that that we have other people. We we are in a global meta crisis where we're facing extinction. It would be nice to elevate actual people who have actual brains and actual emotional literacy. We. It doesn't. It's not impossible to think of political systems that allow those people to become the people who create the means of implementing the decisions made at local level by citizens' assemblies, all of that becomes something that is blockchainable as a way of maintaining the uncorruptible ledger that you mentioned right at the start. Is this where the Web3 revolution is heading, or am I just projecting all of my wishes and wants onto it? No, I I, I would say that I am of the opinion that almost... Most things are better, more localized. So in that way, I mean, that's not everything, but most things. And the problem is, is that you don't have ways to create localized value outside of Web3, to create localized value that transfers in a global way. Right. That's fungible, meaning you can transfer it and and it's something that carries along with you. And you don't also don't have ways to without Web3, prior to Web3, I should say, to decide what that local value is in creative ways. So you can now determine what your local value is and get creative about that. And so long as there is a 
exchange, somebody willing to exchange for that value, that local value can go anywhere in the world. And that really opens up a lot of opportunities because I would like to believe that most people are good. And now I'm not saying everyone's good, but I'd like to believe that most people are good. And so the outcomes where things aren't good are because the systems incentivize something to be bad. And therefore, you know, that obviously as incentive goes, so does your, your, the money flows. So now that way, if, if good people are inherently good, they want to be able to support things that they care about and they want to create a network of those things so long as they're able. So if I can see that at a local level, I can support something because this is not new. I mean, charity has existed forever. It just, this is kind of almost like charity 2.0, if you will, in some ways, like for those now looking for a return, like you can just verify that the outcome happened and you can verify where the funds went and you can verify kind of what other market that goes along with it. People want to make the world a better place, especially if they're in the position to do so. They want to create these local communities that care about the things that they're working on. They just haven't always had the tools. Now we do. And so really where we're at, is just a point where the limit is based off of, especially over the la- the next 10 years or so, is based off of creativity and regulation. Hmm. But if we can move things towards a hyper-local, I think the world would be much better off. Brilliant. By and large. By and large. Okay. We haven't got to chat GPT, but let's do that another time, eh? because that's a whole huge rabbit hole on its own. And it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Right. Thank you. In that case, thank you. If... People want to get hold of you. I'll put your LinkedIn. If you're open for that, I hope you yeah, don't get ten thousand emails all at the same time. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I this has been really interesting. If people want to learn more, mm-hmm. where would be a good place for people for whom this is not a familiar space, but who have become encouraged by what you've said to find out particularly more about DAOs and Web three? Yeah. Well, so. First and foremost, you can listen to the Doi Foundation podcast. It's on Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, iTunes, most of the places, Google Music, where you're listening. I will link it in the show notes. Yep, for sure. Perfect. Um, you can listen to that, but you can also, too, what I would say is uh, there's actually a number of really fantastic websites, one being DowHQ.co. Um, so good people over there, Lucas and Emmett. Um, started that up and launched it. And it's it's a fantastic website where you can go and you can search for DAOs by like category. So you can start like categorizing different things that you might be interested in. And you can even buy governance tokens. And then from there, of course, if you're not in the space, you'll find out that you're very quickly going to get onto Telegram or Twitter or Discord or something like that, because there's going to be some community discussions that are happening there. But I would say kind of go into DAOHQ.co. And you find yourself go down that rabbit hole. If you're still looking for inspiration, you can, of course, reach out to me um, through the Doi Foundation and also through uh, Crypto World, which I'm also a part of as well. We're going to continue to create a number of educational content pieces and tools to onboard people into the space. But in the meantime, you can always, if you you're, you got an idea, you're not seeing anything anywhere about it, you can always send me a DM that says, hey, I want to change the world in this way. Is anybody doing anything about it? Um, and I'll direct you if I can. And if not, I'll be like, Hey, that's a great idea. Maybe you should, you know, try these tools and keep me posted as you go. Brilliant. Okay. I will link to everything in the show notes and hopefully we'll see an explosion of DAOs based in the UK. That would be really cool. That would be cool. Fantastic. Corey, thank you so much for your time. This has been so, so interesting. And I hope your conversations with the lawmakers go well in the next few days. Me too. And there we go. That's it for another week. A deep dive into the world of bits and bytes and doys and Web3 and the revolution and why it matters. I still think I have a lot of learning to do on this. And particularly, there seems to be a way of looking at the world that is new to me. Genuinely, I had never thought of trying to set up something that permanently allocated ownership of things, partly because I think I'm trying to get to a world where ownership is held in common. But maybe that's not going to work. And maybe this is the way forward. So I will carry on exploring. And in the meantime, 
Huge thanks to Corey for all that he's doing. At the time I am recording this outro, he is busy talking to lawmakers about how to make all this stuff work, which is really quite exciting. So there we go. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with Grace Rachmani talking about her DAO, which is one of the reasons I didn't ask explicitly for examples, because we're going to have a whole podcast devoted to one example. And then there's a group of people setting up something called the Kin DAO that has been on Corey's podcast. And if I can possibly speak to them probably six or eight months from now, then I will definitely do that. Because again, these things sound like the future of the ways that we can create communities of place and of passion and of purpose around the world in ways that might actually work. So, as ever, we'll be back next week with another completely different conversation. In the meantime, huge thanks to Caro C for wrestling with the sound and for the music at the head and foot. Thanks to Faith Tilleray for the website and the continual conversations that keep us moving forward. To Anne Thomas for the transcripts. An extra thank you to Ben of Earth Song Seeds for writing me a very lovely card to say that he listened to the podcast when I was ordering my seeds from earthsongseeds.co.uk. I will put a link in the show notes. And as ever, thanks to all the rest of you for listening. It really makes a difference to know that you are out there, that you care, and that together we are endeavouring to change the world. So if you know of anybody else who wants to get to grips with DAOs and blockchain and all the rest of it, please do send them this link. And that is it for now. Thank you and goodbye.